My guest today is one of my favorite people on the planet, an amazing soul that truly went through an amazing journey, Galen Tupton. I've had enormous uh, support in going in and spending time in retreats. As I was growing up, I didn't really think about meditation. And when I was a teenager, I went quite off the rails. I became a bit of a party animal and I became very wild and living a very kind of um, hardcore party lifestyle, which made me very ill. I did a very long retreat that lasted four years. And the reality is after 10 days, I completely fell apart. The predominant emotion is fear. And we're living in a culture that is all about identifying risks all the time. Even as we're safe. It's almost as if the, the, the painful thoughts and feelings are a doorway into a much deeper place of happiness than you ever knew before. My guest today is one of my favorite people on the planet, uh, Galen Tupton. I actually never met Tupton before. We, we met on, uh, on a Zoom call two and a half years ago uh, during the times of COVID uh, where he truly changed my life. Uh, you know, he doesn't know that actually. Uh, I'll talk about it in a minute. But uh, at the time I saw in Tupton a, uh, an amazing soul that truly went through an amazing journey uh, to help the rest of us souls uh, find a path to happiness and enlightenment. We stayed in touch uh, as much as we could after we recorded uh, our podcast episode. And now finally uh, here at Kate Dowdy's My Best Friends studio in London, uh, we meet for the first time and we meet uh, for me to realize that he is uh, exactly what I thought he was. Um, uh, Tupton has written a new book that he so kindly shared with me before he's about to share with the rest of the world. And it's called A Handbook for Hard Times. Such an appropriate title for what we're about to go through, if you don't mind me saying. It's a monk's guide to fearless living. Uh, I, I consumed it very quickly, I have to admit to you, and I absolutely loved it. Uh, the book is out uh, in just a few days, uh, August 31st. Uh, I would ask you to please uh, pre-order it uh, because I would really love for that book to be a bestseller. Uh, and you know how the publishing industry works. Uh, so if you like our conversation today, please make sure that you don't put your phone down uh, before you get a copy. Uh, of uh, a handbook for hard times. And so uh, I'll, uh, I'll start first by thanking you for being who you are. Thank you. I get that joy of, uh, you know, traveling the world and meeting some of the wisest, uh, but most interestingly, kindest people that uh, most of us don't get a chance to meet. And, you know, I don't know how to say it any other way, but I have a very soft spot in my heart to those who choose uh, monkhood. I think people have heard me many times saying that uh, if I actually had a choice, I would probably not be in the mainstream of life. I would probably choose the same path myself. But when you and I spoke back in 2021, I, uh, was it 21 or 2020? I don't even remember It was anymore. during the pandemic. It was, it was during the pandemic, 2020. Yeah. Did you tell me you were actually sick when we had that conversation? I don't know if I did, but I was, I was pretty sick. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to this in a second, because when, you, when, we, when we spoke, you taught me that meditation, remember, I'm an engineer. To, to me, everything is about perfect performance, highly optimized, oiled machines. And you taught me that meditation was all about mind wandering. It was all about losing mm. your focus mm. to be able to pull yourself back down. Exactly. And, you know, you never really know the, how far a word that comes out of you can affect people mm. and humanity. I took that to heart, completely flipped my approach. Uh, because believe it or not, not that I was struggling with meditation at all, but before you taught me this, I was such a perfectionist and I used a meditation device that measured my uh, brain waves and I did 97% calm most, on most of my, my meditations, but that lost the joy of meditation altogether. And so I will hold that, uh, I will hold you as one of my teachers, whether you like it or not. 
for the rest of your life. The, w were you actually sick when we uh, when we were talking? Yeah, I had COVID. <laughs> I, I was getting over COVID. I had okay. very very. You didn't look so sick, my man. You, 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 you looked okay. <laughs> I had very very severe COVID at the start of the pandemic, and I think when we spoke, I was in that long COVID phase, and mm. I was still very sick. I'm okay now, but I went through a. Uh, yeah, two years of two years. Two years of being not able to do much. Is that why the book is about hard times? Actually, I decided on the book before COVID. Uh -huh. I, I'd already written a book um, about happiness. I know, yeah. And yeah. and then I I thought now I want to kind of go deeper and, and talk about yeah a, a guide to unhappiness. You know how 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 do you how do you find your way through unhappiness in a creative way. So I wanted to talk about how to work with suffering, work with pain, work with difficulties. And so I had the idea in 2019 and I started to write the book and I got through one chapter and then went down with COVID. Mm. I got COVID at the start of 2020. And so I was very, very sick. And when we spoke, I was in sort of recovery, but still very ill because my heart and lungs were quite badly affected. Wow. In, in which way? Uh, I had blood clots in my lungs oh, wow. and I had myocarditis where, where the heart is uh, swollen. And you were still actively Well, I was teaching. doing, a, as we all were, we were doing stuff through Zoom. Mm. So I was finding ways to position the camera so people couldn't see the duvet around me and the bed. No way. <laughs> <laughs> is that how we spoke? I think I was probably, you know, in a bed. Man! <laughs> Ro robes from here up, paja <laughs> pajamas down below. <laughs> yeah, I didn't care. I'm not, now I'm really weirded about that conversation, but yes, fine, 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 fine. But, th but that kind of dedication, I mean, you continued to travel as soon as we came back from COVID. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you're, you're, you have, your monasteries are in multiple places around the world, right? Yeah, so, so the headquarters is Samuel Ling Monastery in Scotland. Uh -huh. And that's where, I've, uh, where I became a monk 30 years ago and where I've been doing my training. But we have branches in other places. And one of my roles is to help out at some of the branches. Okay, and so you travel to, to visit? I travel to branches and I, will, I also do, uh, give talks outside of that setting. I do a lot of talks in hospitals mm. and schools and even prisons. Mm. Um, I like to bring meditation into all walks of life yeah. and to really take, take away the idea that it has to be a religious thing or it has to be Buddhist. For me, it's just a human experience, yeah. so you can take it anywhere. Yeah. Have you always been a Buddhist? Yes, in that I grew up in a Buddhist family, but my parents never particularly pushed it onto me. It was just there in the background. Yeah. Um, but as I was growing up, I didn't really think about meditation. And when I was a teenager, I went quite off the rails. I became a bit of a party animal and I became very wild and living a very kind of um, yeah, hardcore party lifestyle, which made me very ill. Mm. I, I got very ill and that, that, that stopped me in my tracks. It, sickness seems to be a theme in my life. That, I was just going to yeah, ask if you don't and, mind me and, saying And I, I feel that looking back, whenever it comes up, it's almost like my body's way of telling me, stop and go deeper. Mm. Because that first sickness I had, which was also heart related in, uh, when I was 21, is what took me to a monastery. Mm. I had a very severe burnout. And I think probably because my parents had told me about Buddhism, I, I already had some kind of faith in it. And I heard about a monastery where you can go to be a monk for a year. And I went to this place and I was only going to stay a year, but then I stayed, I stayed, I stayed longer and longer and finally loved it so much I took lifelong vows. Mm. Um, but the initial... How old were you? I was 21. And the initial idea was just to stay a year and get my health back together, get my head together. And then I was going to go back to my old way of life. But... Um, things got under my skin in a really good way. The Buddhist philosophy, the thinking about compassion, meditation, all of those things. And I stayed longer. And I met amazing teachers. I met my, my teacher there, Akon Rinpoche, who sadly passed away now. Um, but I had many, many years training under him, which was just incredible. How, how does that feel like, to train under a teacher? You, you find that it's not what you expect because you expect to meet some kind of wise old person who is going to impart very formal teachings to you. And there is that, that you get that, but you also find it's about the moment to moment relationship of 
the the teacher showing you where you where you need to tighten up and where you need to you know tighten where your to to your mindfulness is too loose or or where you're not being kind enough they're, they're kind of teaching you in the moment so I worked together with Akon Rinpoche as his sort of attendant or assistant for many years and that gave me a lot of time to study under him but in a in a way of studying in life through life through through, through working practice, together through, through traveling together through doing projects observing together him. observing yeah yeah i mean the, the the normally the the image we have of a of a of a teacher uh, from the movies is either Yoda or like, you know. Long white beard. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. But then Actually, like... one of my teachers does have a long white beard, uh -huh. Akon Rinpoche's brother, Lama Yeshi. Uh -huh. But uh, it, it really is, it's it's not what you think. It's not like you're sitting at their feet and they're kind of saying, exactly. now, my child, I'm going to teach you the, yeah. open the secrets to the universe. <laughs> it's not like that. It's that yeah. you work together and you, you learn by example and you talk and... You, sometimes you even talk about your own emotions and your own problems, and they, they, they talk to you about how you can find solutions. So yeah, you navigate them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so so I, as I said at the beginning, I have that addiction to spending time with monks, and I know quite a few of well, them. Well, you already have the haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I You're do. Halfway there. <laughs> I do. It's. I wish I was further there. I, I attempted, you know, uh, last year. Uh, but I yeah, I think. It's never too late, but I think with my current co vows, if you want, my current vows are focused a lot more around the rest of the world than myself. And I think a big part of my value, it's not because I teach anything new at all. It's because I am that modern day warrior. I'm the Google executive. Well, you can be a monk and do that. I can. I understand. I, I'm, yeah. I'm very much out there and yeah. uh, giving talks and writing books and out in the world. Yeah, but but, I, but I've also had the good fortune to have time in the monastery. Yeah, we need that, don't I we? We have time so in retreat. Badly. Whether you're a monk or not doesn't yeah, matter. It's about going in. And yeah. so I've, I've had enormous uh, support in yeah. going in and spending time in retreats. Did, That's did, important. There is a lot of spiritual faith, not just Buddhism, that will tell you that this time alone. You know, sometimes. Uh, you know, Moses walking the desert or, you know, Muhammad sitting in the cave or, you know, Buddha sitting under the tree or whatever, that this is really where the enlightenment happens or the, at least the reflection happens, if you want. And, and definitely I feel the need that this is, this is really, really what my soul is craving very, very strongly, really. I find that re retreat where you're completely alone with your own mind. Yeah you become very honest about yourself. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. my, my, my experience of retreat was I, I did a very long retreat that alone? lasted four years. Four years alone? Yeah. You weren't alone. So there were 20 other monks. Uh -huh. We were in a, in a retreat enclosure, but you didn't spend much time with each other. You're mainly alone in your room uh, meditating all day. And it was, a, it, it was a very interesting experience because I'd already been a monk for about 12 years. And I think... I had a lot of spiritual arrogance when I went what into that mean? kind of pride, like I thought, oh, I'm a monk, I'm, you know, I was maybe one of the more senior monks as well. So maybe I was a bit like, yeah, well, I'll just sail through this. This will be, you know, I didn't know. I didn't think I'd sail through it, but I thought I would do well, yeah. whatever that means. Yeah. And the reality <laughs> is after 10 days, I completely fell apart. And in that retreat, I had the most horrible time, mm. which looking back was very useful. Oh, definitely. But I think it kind of humbled me to myself in that I had to sit there with my own thoughts and feelings and there's no audience, there's no feedback, you're just you. And that can be quite devastating at first because you discover your own inner demons or whatever, but it can be also very healing. 12 years a monk and then you discover your inner demons. Can you explain that? Maybe I did a little bit of uh, suppression before that. Maybe I did a little bit of suppression because, you know, when I, when I um, became a monk, I was definitely driven by suffering into this monastery. You know, I was having depression, anxiety, all of those things, and I was looking for a solution. And I went to a monastery to find a solution. And maybe for me, putting the robes on initially was a way of just squashing all of that down and becoming a so-called spiritual person. So I think I was a little bit pretentious. I probably am in many ways, but I hope I'm less pretentious now. You know, in those days, I think I was just trying to be serene, trying to be calm, trying to be what I thought a monk should be. 
And it's only when I went into retreat that all of that breaks down and it's just you with you and your own mind. And then all that depression came back. Oh, wow. Yes, full force, really badly. And also the anxiety started to build again and, and I was having panic attacks. The whole thing flooded up in me. Looking back, I can see that was incredibly healthy because here I had to learn to deal with the thing that I hadn't dealt with properly. And that retreat of four years was all about dealing with the, that suffering and that pain. And it, it almost broke me. So halfway through the retreat, I, I thought, that's it, I can't take any more. But somehow I managed to get myself into a mode of practice where I could work with it, work with the pain, work with the suffering, and, and learn how to have more compassion for myself. And that's the topic, actually, of, the, your, of your wonderful book, right? So it's that, it's that hard time that takes us to, through the thicker walls, if you want. But I, wa I want to come back to that. But, but before I do, I, I'd like to just highlight uh, what you just said is really, really quite interesting. Pretentious spirituality. Mm. I don't know. There are, I think there must be a term for it. Is, is quite common. I mean, you don't have to be a monk, but there are so many that rush into spirituality and very, very quickly go like, okay, I figured this out. I'm going to talk to people about meditation and then I'm going to say namaste when I meet people. Yeah, and, that, right? and you put that kind of um, misty look in your eyes misty. and try to look, you know, like <laughs> yeah. uh, try to look a bit otherworldly and a little bit detached. And, yeah. and I don't think it's a conscious thing always. It's just you, you want to be spiritual. So you kind of try to look like you think spiritual should look. Mm. And many people do it. I know I was doing it with, with being a monk, it, mm. it's, it's kind of tempting that you put the robes on and then you just try to adapt assume yourself, persona. Yeah. assume that persona. But, but then, so, so, you know, is that a bad thing or a good thing? I mean, for, for sometimes a lot of people tell me that they dislike that very much. And normally my answer is I say, look, it's, you know, people t take different journeys across the path. And it's actually okay if, one, if someone at least wants to look spiritual, then that must be better than not wanting to be spiritual at all. Is well, that, yeah. Is and, that, yeah. And, and when you say, is it a bad thing or a good thing? I, I would suggest that on a nothing spiritual is. path, there is nothing bad or good. It's <laughs> yeah. all part of the learning. And yeah. you, you have to go through um, all kinds of ways of trying things and find your own truth through that. So you have yeah. to make a lot of mistakes. Interesting. But that's is why it, it's called practice because you're practicing, you're, you're learning. You're but isn't monkhood about preventing you from making those mistakes? You're so, sort of like, okay, let's take you out of the party life, put you in a monastery somewhere. I sort of in my heart know my answer, but isn't that how it appears to be? We're, we're here to prevent you from doing those things. Yes, but then you, you go into this monastery and you start meditating, and then the very thing that made you go to all those parties starts to come up in the meditation. <laughs> and then you start using the meditation a bit like a drug. Oh. And then it becomes hugely problemat problematic. So you're, you, uh, yeah, I definitely agree with that. You know, when I first started meditating, I, I found myself seeking a high all the time. Mm. And it was very much... Um, pushing i was pushing myself to get some kind of bliss experience yeah i yeah, wanted yeah, yeah. to get blissed out I, I i find that quite interesting how people talk about meditation is supposed to be you know your joyful moment of the day when in reality it is a practice right yeah and if you're trying to force yourself to be joyful that that's a disaster absolutely <laughs> because yeah. the more you push for that the more disappointed you feel. the more un, you know l the less joy you get from well it. you're coming from a place of i need joy therefore i'm telling myself i don't have that joy the more you think you need to be joyful, the more you're telling yourself, I lack that joy. So you're actually um, somehow shooting yourself in the foot constantly mm. every time you sit down to meditate. And that definitely happened to me. Mm. Definitely, uh, th there was a, a, a lot of um, hope and expectation that I would feel good. Yeah. And, and I had to learn how to work with that and change that. And it does feel good, but it shouldn't be the target. Meditation can feel good, but then if you get stuck with that, you're, you've immediately made it artificial. So that ex this is exactly the learning I got from you, mm. that to stay at 97% calm hmm, was me telling myself that I'm feeling good. I mean, the, the device I used was cheating, 
honestly. I mean, it's a great device. I'm not against it in any way. I actually think it gave me a lot of insight into the state at which my wine, my mind wanders, right? But the way the device worked is it gave you, it gave you nature sounds, mm. right? And if your mind was uh, wandering, your, your, the nature is a little angry, so it gives you rain and wind and so on. And when your mind is calm, it gives you birds, okay? And, you know, tricky as I am, of course, I basically said, okay, aim for the birds. Like, get, <laughs> give me more birds, right? And very quickly, you can train your mind to focus on the mm. birds, right? Uh, and and I, I have to admit, it feels awesome when you're in that calm, quiet place. But that's perhaps not the exercise at all. That's per I don't know how much that would change the person because Correct. would you then become more addicted to the calm? Totally. And also, are you really meditating or is something doing it for you? That's the question. Mm. It's almost as if we lose our own power by giving it to a machine, which is a huge topic, as we know, in, a, in, in the bigger sense. <laughs> Do we want to talk about this? I don't know if we can go there, but you know <laughs> what I'm saying. We definitely <laughs> want to. It's my biggest topic of the but year. But that is what we do in, in, if we use too many meditation apps and devices as well. It's like we give the power to a machine. That's so interesting. We tell the machine, you, you, do, you do it for me. You, make, you meditate for me. Yeah. You make me meditate. Yeah. And for thousands of years, people meditated with no technology. So yeah, they, so it was not like they were missing something and then technology came and made it all better. I mean, in a very interesting way, was, were we missing anything at all? No, I miss the days before technology, right? frankly. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, sure, I mean, look, we're using technology now and of course it has great uses, but it's got out of balance, as we know. It's yeah. Seriously out of balance. I, I believe so. I believe there was a, in, in my personal view, I think it was 2011, 2012, we should have stopped there. We should have just said, okay, this is fantastic. It's like eating. At some point, yeah. you have to say, I'm full. Yeah. Right? Yeah. At right. some point, you have to say, I've eaten enough. I don't need to overeat. Yeah. We've overeaten. Yeah. When you meditate, um, we're, we're going to come to hard times. I promise we're going to come to hard times, but you teach me so much. Uh, when you meditate uh, today with your busy life, how much time do you put Mm, I don't time it. I just do a session in the morning, session in the evening. Oh, you and don't time no, it? No, I don't time it. Uh, That's interesting. Yeah. Um, Again, when, my weird target orientation. Well, I, I do think it's good to time it. And I, I often advise people to do that. And when I'm leading a retreat or a workshop, we definitely time it. But mm. the way I find for me at the moment is I just do my meditation every day, no matter what. A little bit in the morning, a little bit in the evening. And then for me... When I'm giving classes, that is really my meditation work because as I'm uh, speaking and leading the class, I'm in the mindful state. Mm. So I get loads of meditation done in that way as well. Mm. And then I also try to practice tiny moments of mindful awareness throughout the day, mm. little drop-ins mm. throughout the day. I get that. I think, I think that probably is more my approach but also i think what's so crucial and you mentioned this at the start of our chat is how to re reframe that idea that you need to clear the mind or you need to have no thoughts that that's a disaster yeah and i really find it helpful to explain to people that it's the coming back that counts exactly it's the, uh, i i liken it to that rep in the gym yeah totally right it's like it's that you know pushing uh, doing a, a, a biceps curve. Absolutely. Okay. It's the movement, not, you know, not keeping yeah. the weight up here. That's not, doesn't, yeah. It's not like putting yourself in a trance yeah. or being in some kind of altered state of consciousness. It's, yeah. it's work. Your, your mind wanders, you bring it back. Every time you come back to your, your meditation, like come back to the breath or whatever it is you're using, you are gaining strength yeah. and gaining, um, more power in your meditation. So yeah. that means that the thoughts that took you away are the very thing that bring you back. What, what do you mean by that? Well, if, if coming back to the meditation is what makes you strong, mm. you have to have somewhere to come back from. Ah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, that, all those, so that's part of the exercise. Yeah, all yeah. those thoughts, the wandering mind is what allows you to come back. Yeah. So you don't need to feel like a failure for having a wandering mind. It's part of the process. Can I ask you a very personal question? I mean, as a, as a, as a very high-paced executive most of my life, 
I find myself, as I go through the journey of life, wanting more and more of the calm and peace and, and you know, inner work, if you want. Has it ever happened the other way? I mean, is it, is it on the path at all that a monk would come to a point in time and say, I am, I am now ready, uh, I have found my inner peace, I'm going to go the opposite way? What is the opposite way? Just being completely out there in the world, no... Well, I imagine that there are people who meditate, monks or not monks, I don't know, who, who must reach a level where they don't need to meditate. They kind of is go beyond meditate. I, yeah. I assume that that's where my teachers are at. They, mm. they seem to spend all their time serving others and helping others. And for, um, somebody once asked my teacher, how, how long do you meditate for each day? And he said, the question makes no sense. Mm. Uh, and, and I got the feeling that maybe he was suggesting that he doesn't, he, he's sort of, everything is meditation for him. That's probably true. I'm yeah. not at that level, that's why I need to practice each day. Mm. But I, I, I imagine that that is an achievement we could achieve, which is to not need meditation, but to just be the meditation. At the moment, meditation for us is a thing we do. Mm. But what would it feel like to become the meditation? Yeah. Where there's no doer or practice, no person practicing, no practice. That, that's fascinating. I'd, I'd love to experience that one day. I'm sure you feel it some days, right? No. I, my practice is something I do. I, I sit down and I do it. I, I know where I'm at in, in that I'm not advanced. I'm just doing my thing and hopefully one day we'll... I don't really worry you're just, about... You're just humble. I don't worry about where I'm going to get to. I just keep going. I trust the process. Interesting. Hard times. Yeah. So I publicly said that I don't I don't want to call them hard times, but I publicly said that we're approaching some of the most confusing times known to humanity. Uh, partially because of my a topic I champion, artificial intelligence, but partially because we held off with uh, climate change for too long, partially because of political, geopolitical, economic challenges that might be around on the horizon but partially in my personal point of view because of systemic bias. We've held on to a system of constant consumerism, constant uh, wealth shift, constant gap creation of, of, in power and in wealth and in uh, education and in knowledge and in everything uh, that is feeding on itself to the point where, like you rightly said, you know, technology is helping in some ways, but working against us in others. And every other part of the system, I think, is getting to that break point. First of all, do you, do you also see that? Yes and no. Yeah. Y yes, I agree with everything you've said. But the no part of me also has a feeling that part of the problem is we, we hear about it and read about it much more than we used to. Mm. And of course, the way news media is presented is always shocking and arresting and grabbing and clicking to find the ad embedded in the in the news story we, we know that yeah. so yes of course things are, are in 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 trouble the world is in trouble but how we perceive that has changed in that it's coming through our phones all the time in terms of breaking news alerts and yeah. the negative bias in the way things are presented yeah, I mean, I heard that argument before. I don't know if it's necessarily uh, entirely. There is definitely a lot of truth in it that we are much more informed uh, than the 1900s about a child that falls in a well in Morocco and that becomes part of our, you know, canvas of events of the day. When the child did fall in the well in 1900, we never heard about it. I think what, what, where I'm starting to pay more attention is that uh, that same lens has not changed drastically in the, in the last 10 years. We still had the same amount of access to information, uh, but the intensity of it, I think, in the last 10 years has accelerated a little bit. Uh, and I, and in, in, in either situations, whether it is really changing or not, it seems to feel uh, a little overwhelming for everyone, isn't it? I would say so. Yeah. I would say that we feel overwhelmed and also the predominant emotion is fear. Yeah. Fear, anxiety, yeah. 
And we're living in a culture that is all about um, identifying risks all the time. Yeah. Even in terms of... Even, even as we're safe. Yes, or, or, or just the risk is always uh, presented very strongly. Even you, you buy a, a coffee and it says caution, contents may be hot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you buy coffee, you know it's hot. Yeah. It doesn't have to be printed on the label. Yeah, so, yeah it's so, just that, that they don't want to be sued. So Yeah, yeah. We know, and, and we know that that's, that's the kind of yeah. culture we're in, but aren't we being over-presented with risks all the time now? Yeah. And you get on a train and they tell you, if you see something suspicious, phone this number. So immediately you're, well, you're, this, you're on red alert. Yeah. There's suspicion everywhere. Mm. Sure, there's danger. Sure, there are things going wrong. But I, I wonder if our fear and anxiety has been over, over stoked, it's like stoking the flames yeah, very heavily. I can feel that. You're, you're absolutely right. I, I, and I, and I have to say, from my following and from my work, uh, you can see that people are more worried, concerned, uh, anxious. And, you know, it's all around us. And in your book, you're saying that there is a monk's way to deal with that. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I suppose saying the monk's way sounds a little bit um, um, as if you have to become a monk. I don't mean that at all. I just mm -hmm. mean what I'm writing comes from my learnings as a monk. And I hope that people everywhere can benefit, from benefit without becoming monks. Yeah. Um, but I talk about fearlessness. Yes. And I talk about how fearlessness comes from understanding fear. It's not the absence of fear. Mm. If you just have no fear, that's, that's mm. not fearlessness. Yeah. Fearlessness is where you work with the fear mm. and you start to embrace your fear and transform it. Mm. So for me, the message of the book is hard times are amazingly useful as the crucible for our alchemy or transformation. Uh, which I think must be true. I mean, this, if, if you look back at your, at any, any, anything that you value in your life today that makes you the, the person who you are, it must have had uh, some kind of a root in a hard time somewhere. Definitely, yeah. definitely. We all do that. We all look back and see how we've suffered and how we grew through it. In my life, the good times aren't particularly as powerful for me as the the troubles i've had and yeah. things that have helped me grow at the time it's horrible yeah if somebody says you know you're learning from this you want to kind of punch them in the face but afterwards you think yeah i did learn from this so if you look at the four noble truths it is you know in a in a very interesting way it's just very confronting to say that the truth of suffering mm. right uh and and you you know you have to wonder why 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 does one of the noble truths of life have to be suffering. Well, the Buddha began his teachings by saying, look, here's the situation. What are we going to do about <laughs> the situation, it? The situation, exactly. It's like, so, um, look, I didn't create this. No, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not that Buddhists believe in suffering as if it's yeah. a choice. It, yeah, it is yeah. what it is. Yeah. But the word suffering is a little bit heavy handed. Uh -huh. It sounds like we're talking about very overt, extreme pain. Mm. The, the word, the language the Buddha used uh, means many things. The word suffering actually covers all kinds of discomfort. Okay. Any type of dissatisfaction, just that feeling that something is always missing. Uh -huh. And the, the Buddha's message is that the reason we feel something is missing is because we look outside all the time and we don't look inside. Mm. Because we don't know how so to... So beautiful. Because we don't tap into our own limitless potential, anything outside feels incomplete. We're trying to complete ourselves by looking in the wrong direction. Mm. So look within and we'll find that completion. Yeah. That's what suffering means to me. It means looking in the wrong places. But isn't, isn't you know, the modern world entirely about that incompletion? It's yeah. like... And we have to feel incomplete, so we'll buy more. Yeah. That's We're not... told you are incomplete. How can <laughs> you possibly feel complete unless you buy my product? That's what we're told. We've created that. We've created a world that tells us we're incomplete. Yeah. And that you are incomplete is needed in order for the wheels to keep turning. So it's made us quite ill. What do you do about that? I think uh, we need to use things like meditation to protect ourselves from um, being over-influenced by those, those voices. But on a deeper level, I think if we use meditation, 
we can discover something within us that we were always looking for. The, the beauty, the happiness, the wisdom, the compassion. If we start to tap into that within us, we can become enormously strong and resilient and we can help others. I mean, meditation is absolutely about compassion and being of benefit to others. So we have that capacity, all of us. Yeah. So, so let's go back to fearlessness. Uh, you said understanding fearlessness, mm. working with it, uh, understanding fear yeah. and working yeah. with it. Yeah. I, I think so. Well, how do you do that? So I feel that um, fearlessness can arise when you go into your fear and you learn how to work with the energy of fear rather than the thoughts about the fear. Yeah. So when I, when I was in that retreat and I was experiencing very strong anxiety, I, I had to teach myself how not to listen to the story about the anxiety. I'm anxious because of this or that, or what if this happens, or what if that happens? You know, the words, the, the mental chatter. And instead, I, I had to learn how to move into the feeling in my body. The anxiety or any emotion has a physicality to it. You know, you feel the kind of heart sinking or the, the belly fluttering. There's a feeling. Mm. So when you move into that feeling, you, you give the feeling compassion. Because the, the, the quality of our awareness is always filled with love. Yeah. If, if we take away the stories, we, we'll just find love. Our mind is a loving mind. Mm. Because, why is that? It's because we want to be happy. Mm. Anybody who wants to be happy is because they have love in their, their heart. They want happiness. Mm. Happiness is an expression of love, isn't it? Mm. So, so if you move into the fear with that loving mind, the fear starts to change, starts to transform because you're not uh, pushing it away. I, I think the main problem is that we have a difficult emotion and then on top of that we have resistance. Yeah. But isn't the energy of fear itself directional? It's basically saying run away. Yes, and sometimes, of course, run. I'm not suggesting that if you're being chased by a tiger, you should sit there and say, I'm going to lean into my fear. <laughs> I mean, yeah. get the hell out of there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah, there are dangers. Mm -hmm. Deal with them, of course. But, yeah. but don't we also just have this rumbling undercurrent of fear for no reason? Yeah. Or there, is, there are reasons, but we're not in actual immediate danger. That's when we can start to seriously work with uh, transformation of the emotions. Which means what? I can take fear and turn it into? I feel that if you rest into the emotion, like relax into the emotion, uh, the resistance disappears because you're fully embracing how you feel. Yeah. And then when you fully embrace that so-called negative emotion, how is it negative anymore? It's just energy in your body. Mm. And when you take away the resistance, that energy starts to transform. So fear, anger, hatred, unhappiness can start to melt into joy because the resistance is taken away. I find that quite intriguing, actually, because a lot of the time, you know, you, you, I think most of our audience will have uh, experienced this. When you stop resisting, everything seems to work fine. Yeah, resistance right? is the issue, isn't it? Yeah. And it, in my book, I, I, I kind of ask the question, is there any, any suffering other than resistance? That's such a profound question. Does suffering exist beyond a feeling of, I don't want to suffer? Wow. That's a question, isn't it? And how much are we conditioned, especially in modern life, to constantly seek comfort and constantly push away any tiny bit of discomfort? And so how much is that just making us into resistance machines, mm. which means there'll always be suffering? It's almost like the resistance creates something to resist or be resisted. So we're almost building suffering through our resistance. Yeah. So what if we take away the resistance? And of course, meditation is about that because you just uh, rest into or uh, move into the feeling without pushing it away, without judging it, without telling yourself stories about it. You, it's just you in the feeling. The resistance goes and then where is the suffering? Yeah. Suffering is resistance. So in, if you manage to find acceptance, then by definition, you're not suffering. Yes, and I always struggled with that because my, my teachers always used to tell me, you need to accept, you need to accept yourself, you need to accept this, accept that. And I always assumed that meant you, you have to put up with it. I thought acceptance meant you have this kind of grim, 
resignation. <laughs> oh well, I'll just deal with it. You know, I'll just yeah, it carry is it. what it is. It is what it is. I hate it still. I, I but... hate it, but I'm going to put up with it, and I'll mm. just power through. Mm. That's not acceptance. That's just gritting your teeth. Mm. I I think acceptance is much more about opening yourself up and relaxing into what you experience and being okay with it, having love towards your feelings. For me, what was very, very important was in that long retreat when I learned how to stop hating myself and my emotions and instead moving towards them with kindness. And the, the, the whole in, in, inner landscape inside you starts to change when you do that. So I find that interesting because, you know, one of my early meditation practices was, you know, I, I had a resistance at the beginning of my life to the idea that breathing is life and, you know, focus on your breathing. And not that focusing on your breathing doesn't get you to calm, but that I didn't like the concept of breathing is life because my mathematical brain said, yeah, and heartbeat is life and, you know, brain waves is life and peeing is life and everything is life. So why did we sing single that one out? And in my highly resistant mind, I said, it's because breathing is mechanical. So if you, you know, if you focus on it, you're focusing on, on, on something other than thoughts. And in my early meditation practices, I would actually take a drop of water and put it on the tip of my nose. And then it starts to itch around 40 seconds in. And it's quite, quite analogous to what you're just saying. It's because at the beginning, I would tell myself, I'm going to spend five minutes just, you know, resisting the itch and that's going to draw my thoughts into, uh, into the itch, not my incessant thoughts. But then I will have to admit, eventually you sort of really tune into that feeling and it doesn't feel negative anymore. It has no polarity to it. It's just a feeling. And it, you know, I don't know how, if people will, will sort of go his crazy when I say this, but then eventually it feels like living. So you, you, you eventually just focus on it and feel completely alive. I think that breathing is, is used to a certain point. I mean, it's not that we have to use breathing for the rest of our lives, Absolutely, but it's yeah. a starting point. Yeah. And the reason we might focus on our breath is simply because it's something happening all the time in Correct. the present moment, yeah. something to come back to, and it's very useful. But what you described just then is a, a further level mm. where you don't necessarily need the breath, but you're just going to meditate on your experience of the here and now. Mm. So that's very good because then you're kind of transcending the need for a particular support. You're just in the now and you're meditating with your, your present experience. And the meditation is not really about focusing on something. It's about being, you, being the awareness. Exactly, being, being here and now. Being here, being the awareness. Mm. It's about getting in touch with your own awareness rather than what you're being aware of. Yeah. So, so when, when, we, when we say, okay, we understand fear, we tune into it, we stop resisting the emotion, that, that's not the end of hard times. Hard times continue. Hard times continue, but you have a, a different relationship with them and you, you have a tool through which you can work with the emotion that the hard times triggers. Mm. Because ultimately it's all about how we are triggered. Yeah. And once you start to work with that emotion, you, you can start to suffer less. And that gives you the space to be able to help others. So hard times then become the 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 fuel for your compassion training yeah and we know this anyway everybody in this world will say yeah i i i certainly understand people more because i've been there i've yeah. walked in their shoes we all feel that don't we that yeah. hard times have given us some kind of compassion and the meditation path is all about growing that expanding that and, and letting that become who you are do, do, do you believe that hard times are our future expectations of hard time are also a bit exaggerated. I mean, some of the work I did was, uh, you know, it doesn't look very positive economically for the next few years. And you could see that for a few years in the past. And so I started to understand what happened with the Great Depression, for example. And interestingly, when you, when you, when you hear interviews of people that went through the Great Depression, which is the deepest economic downturn in history, 
they talk about things like, yeah, so I had to move in with my brother-in-law and then, you know, we had to work things out together and it turns out that he has a tool that I needed for myself, to, right? It's quite interesting when you think about it that many will talk about it fondly, mm. which is quite unusual because it seems to me that a big part of the suffering is anticipation of the suffering. Yeah, and afterwards you look back on the, your times of suffering and you, you, you feel that you, it was a very fruitful, meaningful time in your life. Yeah. At the time, it's very hard to think that. Yeah. You know, when I was nearly dying of COVID, I wasn't thinking, yeah, this is great. I'm going <laughs> to write a book about this. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't in my mind. I was just trying to survive. Uh -huh. But looking back, you, I, at the time I had COVID, also the, the hard times I had in retreat, I, I miss that in a way because you do. yes because That's a big statement. it was a it was a beautiful time of discovery um and i learned yeah. so much from it I, I, i've become stronger through those experiences so yeah. i absolutely am grateful for those experiences yeah. is there a moment at which things settle what do you mean so when we were having lunch and i was, I was talking about my silent retreats mm. i you know i'm you know, resisting and I want to reach out to my phone. And, you know, in my case, it normally lasts seven to eight days. And then afterwards, you sort of start looking at the phone and go like, what's that? I don't even remember what this is. And then eventually you go, you look at it and you go like, oh my God, I really never want to hold that thing again, right? So somehow there is, there are moments of transformation where uh, I don't know if, I, if it's fair to say, you get back to your nature, to your truth. Okay, and your truth is not supposed to be uh, what we've made it in the modern world. You began by asking, do, do things settle? Mm. And I wonder if that is the point of retreat. Do, do we want to get into a state where everything just calms down and we're sort of tranquil? I would find that quite boring. <laughs> you know, you? if you're just yeah. calm, chilled, serene. Yeah. What to me is meaningful is where you are in a very creative dance with your own emotions and thoughts and you're working with them creatively and learning through them yeah and that's when you feel you're doing the work yeah no that's not my experience at all my experience is that as i go through those retreats um i i think what ends up happening is that just the the, the absence of the distractions of the modern world mm -hmm. Uh, leaves behind when when that settles, okay. When the noise, you discover some space that you never unbelievable knew. Unbelievable yeah. space. Yeah. yeah, it's just pure joy. So and pure pure. I don't know what it what the word is. Not enlightenment, but pure. A lot of clarity around things that were very confusing in your mind, and you just give them space, and they sort of like you know just keep settling down and suddenly you look down and they're settled the blue is here and the red is here and the green is here and you didn't do any effort at all i think what many people discover is that they go into that that sense of clarity and peace and then if you do an even longer retreat then that gets shattered oh yeah <laughs> good 40 days works for me then <laughs> let's oh, not yeah. go to no, 41. <laughs> I, I mean four years i i i i wish i could actually you know vow it's to fascin experience it's that. fascinating yeah. because you maybe do feel that that the busyness of life is 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 uh dissipating and you can you can feel more calm and more present and then after a few months maybe well in my case it was 10 days but that's quite rare mm. after a few months the suffering starts to yeah. maybe manifest Mm. The, the suffering you haven't dealt with. It's mm. almost as if the river is more still and now you can see what's at the bottom, the mud at the bottom. Ooh. And that's when you start to feel you're really doing the work and it's quite unpleasant, mm. but surgery is unpleasant, but you have surgery if you need it to save your life. Mm. To me, the retreat felt like surgery with no anesthetic, oh. but I've wanted that. Yeah. If somebody had said, I can take you out now and you won't have to feel it, I would have said, no, leave me here. Leave me in this because I'm learning something. Wow. So, so in the times where we're now, hopefully everything will be easy, but if times become difficult, what are your sort of like three tips to people? I always struggle when people say three, because I usually just think of one. One is good. <laughs> one is even better. Yeah. I, well, to, to, to understand that suffering is a reaction of, I don't like this. 
I, I, I hate this and or, or I am resisting this and to work with that. Obviously, there are situations where we need to speak out for change. I'm not suggesting becoming passive and just so internalized that people can abuse you. I, I'm not suggesting that. Of course, there are situations where you need to speak out, you need to make changes. But generally, with, with our stress and misery in life, what we can really change is our mind. And so if we can go within and experience our emotions differently, then the hard times will change. Mm. The hard times are an emotion about the hard times. You know, you could ask yourself, am I suffering because of this, this, and this? Or am I suffering because of my thoughts about no, this, 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 and this? Absolutely. Of course. And yeah. you can change those thoughts. Absolutely. But I think the method I'm trying to... to um, describe here is that you're not trying to get rid of those thoughts, you're trying to go further into them and discover that they actually unlock some kind of happiness. Yeah. It's almost as if the, the, the painful thoughts and feelings are a doorway into a much deeper place of happiness than you ever knew before. That's really, really profound. So, so if, you, if you live like that, you don't become a, like a masochist wanting to have a dreadful time, but you certainly can become interested and curious about what life might throw at you because you can go deeper and deeper and deeper into and true that, happiness. That, that is what the journey is truly all about yes. I mean, in, in a very interesting way. Whenever I speak about suffering as the teacher, you know, the typical reaction will, is people will say, okay, so maybe suffering is good. Even suffering is not good or bad, right? It's, it's not it's what you do with it. It, exactly. It's just, it is, it is what it is as, a, as part of the journey of you going inward. And that's where all the magic happens, basically. August 31st is the date. Uh, I, I have to say to everyone, I, I think there is a very profound message uh, in the idea of being able to look at tough times and say, well, they are. But the, real, the toughest part of them is what I'm doing about them what I'm doing expecting them, what I'm doing anticipating them, uh, what I'm doing dealing with them in myself, not out in the real world. And you may have heard me uh, very frequently speak about the analogy of video games. Uh, video games are wonderful for one reason, that they bring a lot of suffering to your avatar. And, you know, if you can manage to look at it and say, all right, the avatar is in hellfire here, so we might as well do something with it. Uh, and really drill deep into what kind of challenge is your avatar facing. Uh, you you tend to, you tend to find uh, you tend to find that it's not as uh, painful as you think it is, but more interestingly, uh, you tend to find that it's fun. You tend to find the value in it. Uh, Tupton, I always find uh, I actually this is one of those episodes. I'm going to have to say this. This is, by the way, one of those episodes where I'm not going to make it an hour and a half because I think there is so many gold nuggets already, and they are said in such an easy way that they you may have missed them. So I would encourage you to go back and instead of giving you an hour and a half of more things that might overwhelm you, I would ask you to. Uh, to go back and listen again. I think you'll find quite a few gold nuggets in our uh, slightly shorter conversation today. Uh, and at the same time, I can't recommend the book enough. Uh, it truly is a very um, genuine guide to how to find that peace. I thank you very much for being here. As always, I, uh, I am uh, proud to know you and I am uh, humbled by the tiny little things that you drop in your conversation that make me think about the world very different. I feel the same about you. Do you? I do. Don't say that. I do. I say it and I mean it. Uh, yeah, there is a wonderful one. I think, I think there truly is an element of your experience that is a dream of mine, honestly, to have. It sounds really weird, but when you're talking about, uh, about your suffering within a four years retreat after, you know, 10 days, I'm like, oh, lucky you. Yeah. Lucky you. <laughs> so uh, even if I don't ever have the chance to, to, to experience it myself, being in your presence to sort of just get close to its essence is really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. You're an amazing, amazing soul. I'm Thank honored you so to much. Know you. And for all of you listening, uh, lucky you. 
I mean, I, honestly, I'm going to say it this time, you should thank me because I, you know, I get you to meet those amazing souls. I mean, I also want, want to thank you because you get you give me the opportunity to insist uh, that Tupton and I meet in person while I'm here in London uh, and, and to get those amazing experiences for me. And truly and honestly, if it wasn't for you guys supporting uh, what I'm trying to do here with slow-mo, I wouldn't get those opportunities. So for that, I ask you to, uh, to take that interesting way of looking at life without resistance and maybe internalize this uh, as the way uh, that is the best fit for the upcoming interesting times. Uh, I would say this again, I would truly uh, enc encourage you to pre-order the book. Uh, don't wait until it's out on uh, August 31st, because uh, if you wait until it's out on August 30 31st, you help yourself. But if you pre-order it, the way the publishing industry works is that uh, it may actually give uh, top 10 the uh, position that the book deserves uh, on the charts because pre-orders all release in the first week. So if you're interested in the topic, I encourage you to uh, help my brother out by putting him on the chart. You'll be helping yourself out by reading a wonderful, wonderful take on suffering. And uh, yeah, why don't you also help me out by uh, voting this podcast up the charts? Uh, we've recently become in the top 10 of health and well-being in the US, which is a very, very, very big uh, achievement, thanks to all of you. We've been very frequently on the top five in uh, so many places in Europe, and it's just because of your love and kindness and support. So keep doing that, share uh, this with others that you love. And uh, yeah, find yourself a little bit of uh, slow time this week to reflect on that idea of resistance. I love you all for listening and I will see you next time.